going to move the stand up a little bit here, a little bit taller. All right, so good morning, uh, church. Those of you who are here or online or happen to be re-watching it on YouTube or something like that, uh, it's truly an honor to uh, share with you this morning. For those of you who have not gotten a chance to meet me, I've met most people in second service here, I think. Um, my name is Elliot Phelan. Uh, my wife and I started attending virtually in January of 2021. Uh, and we started uh, in person June of that year as well. Uh, I work as a third grade teacher in the Cottage Grove School District, and I've been thoroughly enjoying my summer off. Um, so as I said, first service, if you're looking for somebody to do a bunch of yard work for you, you should look for someone else. Um, <laughs> because I just, yeah. <laughs> Something I've had the immense uh, privilege of carrying my whole life is this uh, deep kind of baritone voice. Um, and so people in spaces that I barely know um, will ask for my opinion or permission or what my thoughts are on something that I have no business offering my opinion or thoughts or have any authority over at all. Um, so I kind of recognize throughout my story today my ability to slip into and out of different contexts um, whether it be moving from one spot to another or different um, venues that I'm at, I've had the ability to slip in really quickly and find a lot of popularity or ease in each of those se sessions. But a lot of that's due, A, to God in interceding in each of those moments, but also due to the fact that when you're someone who appears and looks like I do and sounds like I do as a tall, straight very deep voiced white guy, it's pretty easy to walk into the room and say, hello, I'm here and I have an opinion. And people go, okay, cool. Um, so I said, I'll say I stand before you as a 22 uh, year old with a lot of experiences, um, but many of them are just things I'm still learning from. And it is just all observations of God working, not just through me, but also through those who I've seen around me um, in the communities that I've gotten to grow up in. So um, if you would actually pray with me, I'd love to open up with that this morning, ask God's words to be his and not mine. So uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here today. I, I thank you for all the people that have showed up, even though it's a holiday kind of weekend here, um, to be a part of this community. I pray that my story touches someone in some way, um, and that it is at least entertaining for the next 15 minutes. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So when I was a student at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, they had a, a slogan, so to speak. It's called the power of and. And the idea was that uh, if a student came to Eau Claire, they would be able to be a bio major and they'd study abroad. Ooh, or like they could be a music major, oh, and also a history major. It was basically their way of making you pay for two things and encouraging <laughs> that you could do both of them. Um, and as mature college students, we frequently swapped the conjunction and for the conjunction but and called it the power of but. Um, that's with one T. Uh, <laughs> as looking back over my faith story, I continually get to see that through every transition, God has revealed that my perception of him and his people is good, but God wasn't ready to be put in any box that I put him in. So flashing back here, when talking about 22 years of life, there's not a lot to talk about. So I was born uh, in good old uh, Fridley, Minnesota, Skull Vikes, um, to two Bible college graduates involved in running a student life at North Central University. Uh, my best friends when I was a uh, little baby were college students, and I think that's pretty uh, indicative of the personality that grew out of that. When I was three, we moved from Virginia, or sort of from Minnesota all the way over to Virginia um, for my parents to help take over a Bible college. Uh, they later found out that they were essentially hired to go down with the ship, um, and the Bible college closed two years later. Uh, I was too young to really have any big memories of this happening, uh, but I think that this little bit of di distrust with the church kind of started in that period of time. At five, we packed up all of our stuff and moved to every Washington state. So if you're tracking, that's like we're here and now we're here and now we're all the way over here. Um, the first few years there, my dad was hired as an associate pastor of a larger Foursquare congregation. Um, and as most ministry couples are, my mom tagged along, did almost as much work and didn't get paid for it. Um, Foursquare as a denomination is a rather new group in comparison to that of Lutheranism. Um, formed in the early 1900s, and on the basis that God is our Savior, Baptizer, and Spirit, Healer, and soon coming King. The emphasis being on the fact that spiritual gifts are still alive and well today, and that God is present in the here and now. 
And that's not to say that New Heights isn't any of those things. It's just to kind of distinguish between the social networking platform Foursquare and the church Foursquare, two different things, all right? So Foursquare Church on its West Coast form is definitely a, let's start with 20 minutes of music, everyone's got their hands raised, you get up out of your seat, you pray for your neighbor, and then at the end of service, it's probably 15 more minutes of music, people pray with each other at the front, kind of service. They don't have liturgy. Um, it's not required to take communion. The emphasis is just that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that we are here to be his hands and feet. After about two years of my parents working at that church, they were called to South Everett Foursquare, and it's kind of here that I start to have my first memories of God working around me that weren't just ramifications of previous events. So the church that they took over had a, a floor of a very impressive 12 people in attendance um, and a ceiling somewhere around 30. Uh, it had no kids. It wasn't technically even a church by definition, um, but rather still a church planting project because its size had never in its like 18, 20 years of being around ever hit the number it needed to be classified as a church. Uh, I was cynical as a little seven-year-old, and sometimes still are today, um, of the chances of this congregation surviving. Uh, and frankly, was a little worried after my parents had just bought a really expensive house to live in Washington, uh, of their, this church's ability to support my family financially. Uh, and this is kind of the first, like, but what these people lacked in those Sunday morning skills, the really impressive worship team, and the person up front that charismatically speaks, or even in money, uh, they had faith and mission to make up for. And to this day, I am not sure there are even 100 people at that church. But God still used us in that congregation, and still is, to do great things. So here's a kind of a list of some cool stuff that I got to see God do in that time period. That church started homework clubs that served thousands of kids, hungry and alone after school while their parents worked second jobs, improved reading and math skills. They were so successful that the church couldn't host the group anymore because the church building was too small. So the school brought the church into the school and then the school hosts it now. So the church operates out of the school. Pretty sweet. That's something like what we're doing now. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just, never mind. <laughs> Backpack programs that supplied entire schools with supplies. So thousands and thousands of backpacks were given away. They had such a vibrant foster parent community that they started their own licensing agency to make it quicker to get more foster parents. They had a, uh, created a, quote, safe place for recently pulled out of the home foster kids to stay at, get a shower, get food, talk about what had just happened to them, and all doing that before they get placed in someone else's car as an alternative to sitting in the back of a police car waiting for someone to take them. Uh, and I say that all to say this was still a church of 40 people. Um, what is continually revealed to me through this is that God is not just a God that loves just uplifting Sunday mornings, but also is about the ministry through the members of the church each and every day. And that success of God's mission is not due to whoever's up front talking, the glamour or their ability to speak well, but rather the faith and the drive of the community. And as this uh, church's interest and involvement in foster care took off, uh, my family jumped on board, and it was a family decision. And I say that because um, my parents always, always said, and I think they're listening online, so you can, if you're there, you can comment, well, do you think this is a good idea or not, um, <laughs> that they were raising adults. So whether it be finances or any big life decision that they would make, they would sit down with their kids, little, you know, eight, nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds, and they would make sure that we actually knew what they were committing to. Um, so over the course of our time in Washington, as a ramification of that, uh, I lived with about 50 different kids that weren't my biological siblings. Uh, there were definitely pros and cons to this, uh, and I'm grateful for God's provision and calming presence for my family over this time, because as I said, if we were working at a church of 40 people, and 40 people can't really tie that much, and then you take in three extra kids, I'm not really sure how it money-wise worked out a lot of times. You may or may not know this, but there are not enough foster parents in the world for uh, the amount of foster kids that there are, or I guess households that need kids pulled from them. Um, so a lot of times uh, we would get calls late in the night asking if we would take two kids just for a day or two that would inevitably become weeks or months. That's why foster care in our family was a family decision, is because frequently I would get shaken awake and say, hey Elliot, 
we have two girls coming, so you're gonna, you and your brother are going to have to shift over to this room so we can move your sister into the bigger room so then they can move in this room and you just get out of bed and make your bed and move. It was entirely inconvenient. Uh, it was annoying and it was financially and maybe emotionally a bad call, but it was good and this too even was God's work. So when both your parents are pastors, it sometimes seems like God's ministry only happens here. We get really good at doing this. But that can sometimes be incomplete. God continued to open my eyes that ministry is as big as God is. And in our theology, God isn't just here in the church. It goes beyond that. When I was uh, 11, we got a call that my grandpa was uh, diagnosed with cancer. And the following year, uh, my mom's church that she grew up in, Rhinelander, where my grandpa lived, was calling a new associate pastor to one day maybe transition the church too. So we sat down for another family meeting. We made cookies, and we had a really good life chat about whether or not we wanted to move again. Uh, The previous year, we'd had a life chat about how we couldn't afford private school anymore. So we had just transitioned fifth grade from private school to public school, and now we were going to move again to a different school the third year in a row. Um, It was favorable for some of us, um, like myself, who really loved change, but uh, my sister, who doesn't like change to this day, uh, I think resented my family for several years. And I owe her ice cream for talking about that. But uh, <laughs> my first night in Wisconsin, I remember sleeping on my, my grandparents, like one of those pull out couch bed things. It's really uncomfortable. Uh, and I remember pulling the blanket over my head because these mosquitoes were swirling. And I had never seen or been around mosquitoes until we were visiting our grandparents. I remember just lamenting God in this decision going, There's, this is not good. Because I had everything taken away that I loved, and in return I got bitten on the face. So <laughs> it's not great. Uh, you probably know, but it bears repeating or saying, that Wisconsin culture and Washington state culture are very different. Uh, in Washington, as a 10-year-old, I could bike down to the corner store, order an Arizona iced tea, Um, And when the trees were clear, I could look out, you know, on the Puget Sound Ocean. It was 68 and raining, no matter what season it was. Uh, And if you were sitting in a Starbucks, you could look out the window, and you had a coin flip of whether or not you could see another Starbucks. Um, They're that close together. Uh, Does anyone, this is your audience participation moment, anybody have any idea how many miles away the nearest Starbucks is to Rhinelander? Keep going. This is closest. There you go. 66.7 miles away. Um, And I knew the point seven. Uh, (laughs) The difference is extended into church life, but it also extended into faith life as well. Um, One may think, and maybe you don't think this, but that if you move interdenominationally, that churches would look or sound the same. Um, But if you've ever been to any other ELCA church besides this one, um, you'll know that that's not the truth. Um, churches, even within the same denomination, can be quite different. So coming from a church that uh, shared its sanctuary, sanctuary with three other businesses in the complex, we had to set up our own chairs and our own sound system every Sunday, to a church that had pews was quite a bit of a change. Um, upon arriving in school, I was overwhelmingly popular, which is not something people say in a negative sense most of the time. I fit in great with the youth group kids. I lived on a lake, and I had everything going for me, but I struggled to feel like any of it was right. Um, My default behavior whenever I'm stressed or uncomfortable is to slide into being overly confident and try to take on other people's problems that are around me. I feel safe and comforted when everything is falling apart. I crave change. And over the past few years, I had grown so accustomed to change that consistency was actually the thing that felt unsafe. So to this day, I still love moving. Faith and I were in three different apartments on our first year of marriage. She laments that. Uh, (laughs) She doesn't like moving. I love job interviews. I think they're thrilling. I love talking about financial stress. Um, And I love it when wild stuff happens at school because it's a great way for me to substitute emotional and spiritual vulnerability with other things. I can just be very, very confident, give off this bravado like I know what's doing. 
God had given me so many tools to be overwhelmingly flexible, but now was challenging me to do the unthinkable, and that was keep the friends for more than two years, sleep in the same bedroom, grow not just in flexibility for God's mission, but also in depth. So after something like six years, I left Rhinelander um, for college at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, and I was very excited to do so. As a pastor's kid, I was pretty sure I wanted nothing else to do with church. I wanted to experience what it was like to not be involved with this, what I was now convinced was basically a social club. On my first day of college, an older uh, guy from my floor came down to my dorm room and asked if I wanted to play ultimate frisbee, and since that's basically a giant college cliche, I was like, well, sure, why not? Uh, let's go out and do that. And after hanging out with this group for the better part of the afternoon, I learned that I had accidentally stumbled into a Bible study. <laughs> the guy who had invited me to play Ultimate Frisbee hosted one for, through InterVarsity, which was the same college ministry group my sister was involved in and told me to get involved in, and I was adamant I was not going to be a part of. Um, I went to a large group gathering later on that week, and out of my comfort zone, I started playing this uber-confident character again and accidentally let it slip that I, I knew how to play guitar and piano and drums, and I was a guy who could sing. And By my third week in college, I was singing and leading music. Um, so essentially, I started college super adamant that I was not going to be a part of Christian orgs or anything or church, and by my third week of college, I was leading worship for 300 people. Um, it was really quite a Jonah in the Whale moment for me, but luckily, instead of a giant fish at the bottom of a ship, I got ultimate frisbee. Um, so InterVarsity was incredibly helpful for me in growing my faith. Up until that point, my faith had only been part of my parents. And, and something that had come to me was that I only had one perspective on how God was. And so after being a part of this group that was colliding, of I think this way, I think this way, but there was no malice or hate in that. I was ready to give up on God's institution of church until I saw God move there. And so through the next two years, I started stepping into greater and greater roles, leading music. I co-led a Bible study. I was pretty good at one of those things, not so good at the other one. I saw non-Christians see Christianity truly for the first time. And I saw churchgoers find God that really had never seen him in their communities. I failed epically over and over and over again in my leading. My confidence, my bravado was checked and challenged consistently by powerful and meek women and men alike. And I loved it because they looked me in the eyes and they said, your confidence is great, but you don't know what you're doing. And I said, you're right. <laughs> I learned about God from my Bible, but I may have learned even more from living in community with his temple. So just a, a short little hop, skip, and a jump later, um, through a, a relationship we formed at summer camp, Faith and I ended up here, um, which is, again, very different than any of the faith backgrounds that I've ever been a part of. Uh, I still sometimes struggle as someone who didn't grow up in this Lutheran um, liturgy and tradition. Um, doing things in service the same way, two services in a row, is very odd to me. But here, as New Heights, that was never the emphasis anyway. The emphasis is and always has been that God's love should be evident and amplified by God's people. We should gather on Sundays to celebrate that, but that shouldn't just be it. We should walk and talk and share that through our service and action throughout the rest of the week. So I am very excited in the transition to worshiping over at the Grove, partially because I live closer, but <laughs> here we can still dig in with our hands and feet. That's just an opportunity to do it on a greater scale. We're not starting our ministry by going there. We're amplifying our ministry by going there. And I'm excited to, how, to see how here as a church, I can see the hands and feet ministry I saw in Washington I can see some of the tra traditions that I saw in Rhinelander. I can lean into the daily community and small groups and worship like I did with InterVarsity in Eau Claire. And I can still be a part of this faith, even if it's not always the best liturgical fit or traditional fit. So as we, the greater church, embark on this mission together, I hope that this is the beginning of a new faith story for all of us. And I challenge you 
to challenge me <laughs> because I don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> like 80% of the time. But no matter what, I will always sound like this and I will always sound like I know what I'm doing and I don't, okay? Don't let me run a lot of things. <laughs> I challenge you to challenge one another to continue to be God's hands and feet no matter what obstacles come up here. And I challenge you to exercise the butt and continue to open your eyes to what else God has to show you. Maybe it's someone else's perspective. Maybe these faith stories have helped. But I think God is greater than any of our traditions or any of the ways that we may perceive him. Thank you.